Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Chris Brown, and I am pleased and honored to have our guest on the show today. He is a retired counselor from up in the Edmonton Spruce Grove, if I'm not mistaken. He'll correct me if I'm wrong here. Spruce Grove City Councilor for 26 years and now a municipal contractor working with municipalities across this great province, Wayne Roth. Wayne, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for inviting me. I uh... I love municipal government. And I look forward to chatting with you about it. So, Wayne, I, I, I guess we need to introduce you to my listeners and to my viewers first off. So I, I have asked this to every single politician or former politicians or candidates to be politicians who have always come on this show. And you're no exception to that rule. But where did your sense of duty to serve come from, Wayne? Well, I've lived in Spruce Grove for probably about as almost as long as you've been alive. I have uh, lived in Spruce Grove now for about 44 years, and I have always felt a sense of duty to serving my community. I've always felt that communities excel when citizens serve in whatever capacity they can. Long before I was elected to council, I served one term as a local school trustee. And long before that, I don't know when I got this old, I served on a couple of local boards and committees. It's a philosophy I've always held. And I always try to encourage citizens to serve their communities in whatever way they can. I've actually done some active recruiting to find local people to sit on various boards and committees. And I, uh, I, I, just, I just love serving the community I've, I've, I love, the community in which I've chosen to make a life. Uh, my wife and I have raised our family here. And, uh, and that's, I think, that's one of the reasons why. Not because of me, but it's because of volunteerism that uh, that Spruce Grove is the wonderful city that it is. What was it about municipal politics that drew you to it? Because most people, when you think of politicians, you think of federal or provincial. And we always forget about municipal politics. For you, what was that drive to get involved on that municipal council uh, for you? A couple of things. Number one is I'm a former journalist and I was a reporter in the local area. And I covered, uh, then it was the town of Stony Plain, town council meetings. I've covered Parkland council meetings. I've covered town of Stony Plain uh, council meetings. I've covered, um, I've covered in various ways. I've covered local government. And I always thought that would be really cool. And I thought I had a contribution that I could make. And so I ran as a school trustee. I served one term. And then as I was a school trustee, I, I often had people ask me if I'd like to sit on town council. And I always poo-pooed the idea because it really wasn't a big interest of mine. But eventually, as I watched local government, which I have always done, I saw that it was it was an interest. And I ran for the first time in 1995. I never imagined that it would be a 26-year gig. But serving my community in this way has, has been one of the greatest honors of my life. What I most like is the opportunity to influence. I'm getting a little off track. I hope that's OK, Chris. But it's perfectly perfect okay, Wayne. To, to influence in a big way the future of the community in which I've chosen to live, operate my business and raise my family. I can now, and this is one of the things I most like is I can now drive or walk around Spruce Grove and I see wonderful things. And I can say, yeah, I helped to make that happen. One of the best features is our wonderful recreation center. And I was here to help make that happen. The, the job of an elected official is incredibly demanding especially when you're raising a young family and working in a full-time job. Here, it's roughly the equivalent of a half-time job to serve on council. It's really hard work and not always appreciated by your citizens, especially with social media being what it is. My life has been, my life was for a quarter of a century, extremely hectic. And I had and still have a wonderful supportive wife. Otherwise, I could not have done this. You you talk about, the demands of the job 26 years sorry 26 years on council you must have loved it though right because you wouldn't continue offering your name if you didn't think the pros outweighed the cons because while it's demanding you are the first line of politics that we as citizens deal with on a regular basis on a day-to-day basis municipal council if your water doesn't turn on you talk to your municipality if your garbage doesn't get picked up you talk to your municipality if your paved, if your road is cracked, you talk to your municipality. The the pros of 
influencing some of the decisions that are made, some of the benefits, the changes that you make to your community must have outweighed that hectic schedule of constantly working, constantly being inundated by citizens' requests. So there must have been pros and cons to it over the 26 years, but you kept at it. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things you've touched on, Chris, and I'll just maybe speak to that briefly is, now you're, you're probably different because you're very attuned. You're a, a, a former municipal government employee. You're, you're attuned to what happens in government. So I would suspect you know who your MLA is and you know who your member of parliament is, but your neighbor may not. But your neighbor probably knows who your mayor is and some of the councillors. That's because the services that we provide are absolutely essential. Like, for example, when you get up in the morning, you turn your water on to make a pot of coffee, to have a shower. Uh, you want that water to be running without, without problem. You, you need the electricity, you need the roads. In the summertime, you're, you might be dodging potholes in the wintertime. There might've been a big snow dump overnight. You wanna make sure that your roads are in good condition for you to drive to work. And if you have children, for your children to hop on the school bus and get to school. So that's, uh, that's really essential. The second thing I want to make, uh, I want to speak to is, um, yeah, we, uh, uh, we, we're in the communities all the time, in our communities all the time. And when you're in a grocery store or you're out on the street or whatever, people tend to know who we are more so than their provincial and federal elected officials. So they have no problem talking to us. And that's great. I'm not saying otherwise, it's great but they have no problem coming to us when they have a suggestion or an issue that they want to make sure happens or, or something that they think their municipality should do. And, and that's, that's wonderful that they do that. But we're, we are, as, as I think you mentioned, the, the front line. We're the front line in government. Uh, I take the, the three levels and flip them upside down and put municipal government on top. I think we're the most important level of, of government in the whole country. You, you mentioned something, and I want to get your opinion because you you you've you've been there, you've done it, and I haven't had the opportunity to talk to many people who have served on councils like you have. But you talked about the the citizens always coming up to you because, like you said, they won't know their MLA, they won't know their MP potentially. I'm not saying everyone doesn't know their MLA or MP, but uh, but they will know their councillors, they will know their uh, their mayors or their reeves. Um, while you were serving on council, and I've asked this to candidates who were getting ready to run in the last municipal election, um, was it hard to balance that work life uh, sort of li a lifestyle of when I'm at work, when I'm doing council work, I'm separating myself from when I'm at home and I'm with my family? Because if you're in a grocery store, because I've seen it happen in municipalities across this great province where a councillor or mayor will get stopped because they are the, the representatives. And if a citizen sees them, they'll stop them and ask their question. Was it hard to balance that work life? Uh, was it hard to balance that work in life? Well, two points to that, Chris. And number one is I never minded when people would stop me on the street or in the, the grocery store or wherever I happened to be where we would encounter each other because that's the job I signed up for, and I didn't mind doing that at all. In fact, I would encourage it. Uh, the second thing is when you talk about work-life balance, for 26 years, I, was a, I sold my business about two and a half years ago. I was a certified financial planner and an investment advisor, and I had a storefront office, and people would stop in frequently to talk to me about municipal issues, stop in at my office. Uh, it's, it's a... It's, these, are, these are visits that I never really minded, even if they cut into my work day a little bit, but they knew who I was. They, they saw my name on the front of the building and they knew that they could either stop in and talk to me or, be, or I would politely excuse myself, which I, which I don't think I ever did. But I was out there, I was front and center. And when you talk about work-life -life balance, I, I, I worked in a, a, a business that required probably 40 to 45 hours a week of my time, plus my job as an elected official was probably about half time, plus my wife and I were raising two young children for, for, for a lot of the time that I was in local government. So it's incredibly demanding. And most people who, who work in local government, who are local elected officials, they do, if they're not retired, they, or if they don't work for some of the larger cities like Calgary and Edmonton, 
where the positions are full-time. Uh, we're part-timers and we're paid on a part-time basis. And we usually have, have jobs that we're required to work at too. So the schedule is in, incredibly intense. I, I want to get your opinion on what a, what makes a good counselor. As someone who was there for 26 years, you you get you keep getting reelected as a sitting counselor. So you must have done something right. In your words, how do, how does a person become a good counselor who will represent their constituents the best? I think that's a, a really involved but great question, Chris. And I would say that that could be the topic of an entirely different uh, session, but just to maybe sum it down into one or two key points. I think number one is when everybody runs for office in any capacity, they always say, you know what, I'm the best guy or the best woman for the job. I have the best interests of my municipality at heart. But when you're elected, it's, it, it, it's time to prove it. And some people will say what they need to say in order to get elected and then not necessarily carry through. But I would say maybe number one priority is you have to have a genuine interest in doing the best for your community and making the best decision that you possibly can every time you put up your hand or you push that button to vote. Uh, because sometimes there is an inclination to go with the flow and to do what's popular, but what's popular is not always what's right. And I can give you many, many examples where, where there's a difference. What's right is what's in the best interest of your municipality and what's popular sometimes is what people will, will do or say or vote because they wanna get reelected. And, and, and that's, that's the first job of any elected official. If you're intending to run again, your first, your first task is to get reelected and to, to win support. And granted, everybody wants to do that, but you, can't, you have to be able to look yourself, come home from a council meeting, Take your suit off, undo your tie, look in the mirror and say, yeah, I think I did the best job I could for my community today. You, you've opened up Pandora's box a little bit here, and I want to play in it if you're okay with me for a few seconds you, here. You, you opened it up, Chris. <laughs> well, you, you, you said something that sparked my interest, and I want to play okay. with Pandora for a little bit here. Okay. It's about doing what is right and what is best for your uh, constituents, which in this case would be a municipality. How do you balance that? Because every councillor who gets elected, I don't care if you're from high level, all the from Okotoks, from Innisfil, wherever you are elected, you always have the best best ideas for how your city is going to move forward or your municipality is going to move forward. But at the end of the day, the people who elect you are your boss in the, at, the, at, at the end of the day. And what your constituents want, so the residents of your community, is going to be what you need to vote on. So if you as a counselor have an issue that's in front of you that you are very passionate about, whether it be paving this road over this road or fixing this area or putting in a skate park in this area of the town over this area of the town, how do you balance that? Or how did you balance that in your 26 years as a counselor against what you believe is right and what your constituents want? Because I think there's a very uh, big gap in that in some politicians today. I'm not saying all, I'm saying there's a few that will say, I want the best for what I believe is right. And sometimes the constituents get it wrong. Uh, I would say for me, it's been like a 90-10 balance and I'll explain it this way. Uh, some people will gravitate more to what is politically popular and what's going to gain them support. I always try to do the 90% of the time I would say that I tried to do what was right. And once in a while, uh, public opinion would, would influence my, what I would say, how I would say it, and sometimes how I would vote. But I always believed that I was doing the right thing at all, uh, all times. And I never let, and I've had actually had people tell me, I'm never voting for you again because you supported this medium density uh, apartment or uh, a row housing uh, project in my area. It's just down the street from me and I didn't want it. And I told you I didn't want it, but you supported it anyway. And I always had to be able to be able to tell the resident like that, that I was trying to do what's best for my community. And yes, you're a constituent of mine, but I also have 40,000 other constituents and I have to consider 
what's right for the people on the opposite end of the city, not just the people down the street from a development that you may disagree with. So that's how I tried to balance it. Do you think a lot of councillors do that now? Because we'll talk about that in a few minutes, because we, we, in this polarized world that we live in, do you think that the politics of municipalities and uh, communities is getting uh, dictated by the politics of federal and federal and provincial po uh, politics? Or do you think uh, the municipal politics is a, still a safe haven for being able to communicate with your residents and say, this is why I did it. You may not like it, but at the end of the day, I had to look at it for the best of all the city and not just your street who might be affected by that medium dwelling that is going to be going in. I don't think it's a safe haven at all. I think it can be sometimes can be quite, um, quite dangerous. And I would say a lot of that is due to the influence of social media. And I was hoping you would ask or open up an opportunity where I could talk about that because social media has made this and it's actually, now I was ready to retire anyway. So I chose not to run last October. Um, with my wife's support. If, if, she, if she had her way, she would have had me quit probably two or three terms before I did because she thought I, I should move on to other things. But I retired of my own accord. And one of the reasons why I decided to retire when I did, I had other reasons, like I wanted to start doing some consulting and things like that. But one of the reasons was uh, social media was making local government, provincial government, and federal government. And the higher you go up the ladder, I think the more vile it gets but they were making it a very difficult environment in which to work. I've seen some of my colleagues and me on occasion too, who have been attacked. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Counselors may sit through several meetings and look at maybe hundreds of pages of reports and documents in order to make one decision. And then all somebody sees is a newspaper headline and they, and they go off on us on social media because taxes are going up by three and a half percent or some project that they disagree with is be, as being approved or that sort of thing. But they don't understand, they don't have all the information that we do. So if I had one piece of advice for, uh, for citizens, it would be be patient and understand that your local elected officials have access to a great deal more information than you do and respect that. And if you wanna have something explained, then reach out to your local elected official and he or she will, will be happy to talk to you about it. But I think that's one of the, sorry, I'm getting a little off track. If I, if I haven't fully answered your question in how you want it, uh, please uh, let me know. No, I appreciate that. But you, you mentioned something that I wanted to talk about a little bit later, but we'll do it now if that's okay. And that yep. is social media. You you have seen the transition of municipal councils from not social media to the from the uh, letters to the editors in the local newspaper, from the town flyers that go out to a social media communication style that a lot of municipalities have been picking up. Um, and... <clears throat> pardon me, and even in your um, work as a contractor, you probably have to deal with us on a regular basis. How do we get past that? How do we get past the vile and vitriol of social media from a council's perspective, from a municipality's perspective? Because we all think that it shouldn't be there. It's, it is something that people can just write random things on and it's just out there for everyone to read. But it's the best way municipalities are communicating to their residents right now. As a former communications person, I know my council said, it put it up on social media. It all has to go on social media because that's where everyone is. And you have to let people voice their frustrations, good, bad, and ugly, and let them do it. Because at the end of the day, they're paying the, our, our salaries and they're paying our tax dollars. And they're the ones who are paying for those roads to be fixed. So let them vent when they need to vent. Social media has social media can be a very good thing and it can be very a very bad and dangerous place for local for any elected official to be. Um, the good the good about social media is that it allows elected officials to stay really attuned to the uh, the community and they can they can hear. I belong to several fa lo local Facebook groups, not just the several that exist in Spruce Grove, but in other municipalities, some municipalities in which we've done some consulting work. I've chosen to belong to their local face, Facebook groups. I belong to some others that we have not worked in. 
but I want to know what people are thinking and what they're saying. So that's the good thing about social media for elected officials of all stripes and at all levels. The bad thing is people will say things to you on social media that they will not say when they encounter you in the Safeway store <laughs> or on the street and where they might be quite polite, and then they might go home and maybe uh, they may say, talk about the same issue, but they'll, they'll, they'll talk very differently about it. And they may, the, the, the politeness sometimes turns to rudeness and can turn into attacks. And We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. You talked about your decision not to run for a re-election in 2021, last municipal election with you and your wife having that discussion. Um, since then, since you've uh, left elected politics, you have been, become uh, a consultant. Uh, can you explain to my viewers and to my listeners what you do now and how you are working towards helping municipalities? And we'll go into a little bit more depth of what, uh, how, what you're seeing and how you're seeing it unfold with us coming up to the one year anniversary of the last municipal election. Okay, I'm working with a company called Bloom Center for Municipal Education. This shirt is the Bloom color, corporate color. Uh, Bloom supports municipalities in Alberta and in other provinces as well with education and consulting to municipal councils and administrations. Um, it's essentially training. I would, I would drill it down to it's essentially training and consulting of various types. I'm involved mostly in the uh, elected official stream. So we provide uh, strategic planning, we provide new council orientations, and we provide various other types of consulting to councils and including their administrations as well. On the admin side, the fellow I work with, uh, Tim Duhamel is, uh, is a former, he's currently uh, an acting CAO. He's been working in various CAO capacities, but he's an interim CAO while he helps uh, one of the councils we work with to, to fill the CAO job. And uh, he's, he's an expert and he's one of the most brilliant minds I've ever seen in the area of municipal finance. And he puts on a lot of uh, sessions on municipal finance. He's done them via Zoom and he's done some of them face to face and they're very well regarded. And he's got clients who consult with him on various municipal finance matters from across the country. So that's basically what, what we do. We also, when a municipality comes to us because they have a specific need, we can design a course or a program around that specific need. Uh, so and as I mentioned, we also, or I didn't mention, but I've alluded to, we also help councils recruit and hire their CAOs. And then we can develop a mentorship a, a program for CAOs and training programs as well. Which we're going to be talking about the role of the CAO in a few minutes, uh, but I want to start with the big question because I, I already mentioned it. Uh, we are almost one year since the last municipal election. Now, I, I, I follow politics on a regular basis. I follow municipal politics on a regular basis. And while municipal politics doesn't see a high turnover, we did see some cities, communities uh, elect new fresh faces to their communities, whether it be the mayor, whether it be councillors, whether it be Reeves, we saw a bit of a turnover. In your years of experience and as a consultant to Bloomfield, how does your organization go in and help those relationship building services? Because sometimes you may get a fresh new council and these people don't know each other. While it be maybe a smaller community, they may know each other, but knowing each other and working with each other for the better of the community are two different things because you all have your different ideas of how you want your city to be run, but how you want to progress it. So how, what is the obstacles of new councillors to overcome that difference of how things need to progress in their city? What's that like? Well, first of all, everybody who runs for local office claims to be a team player, right? Uh, once you're elected, that's the team to actually prove it. 
Uh, everybody says that I, I'm a team player. I'm a great communicator. I have the best interests of my municipality at, in, 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 at heart. Those kinds of things. Nobody ever says, I'm not a team player, but vote for me anyway. Um, when, but when you have several strong personalities, and it does take strong people to put their name out there and to put their, get their name on a ballot, because there's, there's great risk and you don't know if you're going to, um, in Spruce Grove here, for example, it's different where you live in Calgary, for example, but in Spruce Grove, you have to get probably 25 to 100 to 3,000 people to put an X beside your name. And if you don't, if you fail, and I've seen some people who have run on multiple occasions in various municipalities, including my own, who, 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 who don't get elected. Like I can think of people who have run two, three, four times all unsuccessfully. There's great rest, but risk, but I give them credit for actually putting their name out there and, and taking on the risk. But when you have several strong personalities who, and those are, those tend to be the people who, who, who do run for office, when they're sitting around a table, there is huge potential for conflict. I'm a bit of a nerd, nerd on the subject of organizational dysfunction. And I, I follow it in local media and in various media. And it happens in various municipalities in Alberta and in all provinces. My, my best advice would be two part. Uh, number one, set aside your personal biases and agendas and always try to contribute to the group to achieve the best decision as a team. Don't just say it. Work, act, work actively to achieve it. That would be um, point number one. Number two, and I think this is incredibly important too, is when a decision doesn't go your way, you have to accept the will of counsel and move on. That doesn't always happen. It's incredibly dangerous when counselors refuse to accept a democratic decision and sometimes work to undermine such a decision. Dysfunction when it occurs can rip apart a council and hamper good governance and no one wants to see it. I think we all have a genuine interest in wanting to see our municipalities succeed and, and dysfunction can, can really interfere with the, the success and efficiency, the effectiveness of, of municipal operations. We, we always try to pride ourselves on not taking things to heart, especially if you're an elected official, but Egos do get in the way sometimes. I think anyone will say egos can get in the way of uh, being able to move past a, a vote that didn't go your way or uh, something you thought was going to go your way didn't. Um, how, how do you do that? Because at the end of the day, you are responsible to your constituents who have put you there. You are elected on a platform in bigger cities like Calgary, each councillor runs on a different platform. In smaller communities, it's usually four or five different points that you're running on. But how do you set aside ego for the best of the city, do you think? I would say it, it goes back to a comment I've already made, and that is you have to um, have a legitimate desire to, to do the best for your community. And yeah, we all have egos, and I don't think anybody would ever run for local uh, local office if they didn't have an eagle. Um, but I would say, number one is, uh, the key point here I think is, have a, legit, a sincere interest in working for the betterment of your municipality and understand that decisions will not always go your way. And I've won a lot of debates and I've lost quite a few debates as well. But I can honestly say that when we left the council chambers after a meeting, if I lost a, a debate, I was still friends with my colleagues and we would maybe argue at the council table, but we went into the next room after the meeting was over. We left the council chambers as, as friends in almost all, in all cases. And I think you have to have a sincere, genuine desire to do what's right for your community and, and try to set aside your ego as much as you possibly can, because it's not about us. It's, it's not about us as individuals. It's about us as, as a group of individuals, and we want to make sure that the community is getting the best governance it possibly can. What role does the mayor and Reeve, or Reeve, I should say, play in unifying the council? Because while we can disagree on issues, what role does the mayor and Reeve play in making sure, like you said, once you leave that council table, you may disagree at the table. You may yell at each other at the table and get your point across at the table. But once you leave that table, you should be all friends again. What role does that mayor and Reeve play? Well, as you know, Chris, and I know you know this, but 
uh, a mayor or a reeve um, has only one vote and yeah. and so it has no more influence except maybe the influence that comes from the position but otherwise has no more voting influence than any other member and i've seen numerous occasions where we have a mayor system in spruce grove as as urban municipalities tend to do tend to have and i've seen cases where mayors have argued for one thing and they have not got their way for for whatever reason th there may be but the mayor does have one of the jobs the main jobs of a mayor i think is to unify council i think that's a responsibility that we all have as elected officials but the mayor's job especially is to unify council and if there's some dysfunction going on uh, the mayor should have a conversation with whoever's involved and maybe do it privately but that's one strategy that i've seen mayors employ where they can they can reach out to hey bob you and sue are are fighting and it's not doing any of us any good can we talk about it and we'll get sue in the room and we can work things out i believe that the best results are usually attained by having reasonable intelligent individuals sitting down together and just talking out our differences and I think that's where a lot of these problems can be, can go away. The first year is usually a learning curve for a lot of new counselors, particularly they have to learn the MGA, They, uh, unless you're in a different province in Alberta, you have to learn the Municipal Government Act, you have to learn the ins and out of how city works, because you think you have an idea of how city works, and then you're elected, you go, oh, this is completely different, unless I wasn't, I was living under a rock, you, you learn the ins and outs of administration, the CAO, the roles and responsibility of council, and what you can and can't can't do as council because people think you are making the decisions and then you're actually implementing it but no the role of the council is to make the decisions and the cao is to implement the ideas with the um, help of the managers the directors and so on and so forth and the staff of the municipality with us coming up to that this year is the learning curve a lot more difficult now than it was 26 years ago when you first got elected? Because I'm assuming it, there was a lot more, a lot less uh, social media had to learn, a lot less dealing with uh, uh, the press in larger communities. Is it a larger learning curve for newer counselors to get elected in 2021 than it was 26 years ago when you were? It is. When I was first elected, I think Spruce Grove, I'm thinking back, was probably a, a small city of about uh, maybe 6,000 people. Now we are a smallish city of about 40,000 people. So obviously when you're, your population size multiplies like that, there's a lot more that you have to know because there's a lot more going on. And as communities grow, they tend to become a little bit more sophisticated. And you know, like with computer systems and things that we use to do planning and all of those kinds of things. Now we're not involved in planning. We have staff for that, but the, for anyone who's never done it, the learning curve is monstrous. And I've never ever talked to one newly elected official who didn't say, man, I didn't know it was gonna be like this. It's a lot more involved. It's a lot more difficult than I imagined. And there's a lot more to know than I ever imagined. Even people who have served on boards and committees in the past and most newly elected officials have served on a board or committee at some point in their life but they all say you know it's it's way more than i i ever thought it would be i've had one um counselor i won't mention the municipality who said i don't know if i can well actually i had one counselor who served in a municipality uh, probably 15 years ago who retired after one term uh, this person had led the polls in her first go at the kick at the cap, we, we decided to retire after one term. And I, I ran into her and I said, so why? And she said, I didn't know it was gonna be like it was. And I think sometimes people think it's, it's a glamorous job and there's a lot of glad handing and public appearances. And those are all parts of the job too. But there's also a lot of drudgery when you're sitting through three hours with a public hearing and a lot of discussion about a, a planning document that you're working on, uh, whether it's the the the, the general uh, uh, development plan or or whether it's a regional development plan, that's not the most exciting thing in my life. And I must admit, from time to time, it's it's hard. And I remember when we were doing Zoom meetings because of COVID, my wife could hear some of this meeting, and she said, 
after the meeting, she would say, um, you know, or during the meeting, because I would mute myself when I'm not speaking. And she would say, well, I don't know how you do this work. It's so dull and it can be, but it's also fascinating in one aspect, in one respect, because you have a great opportunity to influence the direction of your community. So the, the, the learning curve is, is, is huge. And then when you're elected, that's when the, the time commitment spikes because you're immediately tossed into the fire. It doesn't matter if you have no experience with budget, large budgets, you're expected to understand a budget that can vary from a few million dollars to in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars or more. Budget discussions are actually, I think the best orientation into municipal operations. There are also several orientation sessions on specific aspects of how your municipality operates. And on top of that, every councillor has meetings for the various boards and committees they're, they're appointed to. And many of those also have orientations, in some cases, budgets and strategic planning as well. And then there are the, the, the community activities that you're expected to attend. Uh, so it's, it, it, it can be, and on top of that, as I've already mentioned, most of us have full-time jobs or part-time jobs and families too. It's intense. Um, the first year is usually a learning curve for a lot of new counselors. And even if, if you have one or two counselors who are elected, newly elected compared to a size of seven counts, uh, a seven seat council, you still have that learning curve for a lot of those new counselors because the budget process starts right away. Uh, after you're elected in October, if you're going to be uh, passing a budget in November or potentially in the new year. But usually in that first year, when when everything's said and done, you've got your sea legs ready. You're ready to start moving on. And you've got some sort of uh, familiarity towards what the how your role is going to be. But coming up on this year, this is when most counselors start looking at their strategic planning for the next four years. And the strategic planning is what are our strategic goals to move forward the city, the town, the municipality, the county, and how do we how are we going to do that? Because how we've decided what our strategic priorities and our strategic plan is will determine what our priorities are for the budget and what our priorities are for moving forward. In your role as a consultant, how important is it for a municipality to go through a strategic planning session in a, an appropriate fashion? Because some municipalities I've dealt with have said, oh, I can do a strategic uh, priority plan and it's going to be great. And it's usually one or two people sitting around a table and that's it. How important is it to have input from all councillors, whether it be newly elected, re-elected in this, in this time of age? First of all, I'll say that in my, it's my belief that strategic planning is the most important thing we do. Really? Uh, yes. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate on that. And as you've mentioned already, Chris, the strategic plan sets out everything that the municipality will do during the first year, during the term, and over the next several years. And we may not always, elected officials may not always, the councils may, always, may not always have the same faces beyond the end of the term. But but it but it sets out strategic plans are intended to be plans that are in place to guide decisions over the next 10 or 20 years or longer. The strategic plan establishes the what and the budget sets out the how and provides the resources, both the financial and people resources. To get elected, councillors presumably spend a lot of time connecting with citizens. And this is one of the best pieces of advice I can give to elected officials. They connect through citizens, presumably by door knocking or by other means. I always encourage elected officials when they're campaigning to keep a notebook with those comments or when they come home at night, sit down on the computer and computer and type out some notes from what they heard on the doorstep that evening. Um, and when council meets post election for orientations and strategic planning, uh, type out the notes and provide Provide them to your colleagues and to your senior elect, uh, senior administration people as well. An election campaign, I think, is the best opportunity to find out what your residents want. And so I would suggest that people seize the opportunity. So bring those notes to your strategic planning sessions because and, and categorize them because you might have typed up maybe 70 or 80 key points that you heard at the doorstep uh, because your strategic plan can't have 70 or 80 action items but you might be able to uh, condense those down into maybe eight, 10, 12 different 
um, categories. And then those things are things that you need to bring forward to your, to your colleagues. One thing is a strategic plan is, is, is very expensive, both in terms of staff and council time and administrative time as well. And money when you use a consultant, it'd be a real shame to have that document sit on a shelf to gather dust. Uh, I think both administration and council need to use the plan frequently during the term, refer to it often to assess that you're on track and that every administrative recommendation aligns with the priorities established in the plan and that every administration recommendation supports some as aspect of the strategic plan. So make sure that it's used because it costs you a great deal to produce it. And uh, also from time to time, ask for updates on how, uh, on the progress that's being made on the various strategic planning initiatives. How important is it to go back to that document? Because I have seen council, I have worked on councils and I have uh, reported on councils in my at years as a journalist who have done strategic planning. I've never been in the sessions while it happened while as a journalist, but as a municipal employee, I did. And they, like you said, sit on that shelf for four years until the next one, they go, oh, we had this strategic plan. Let's see how much we've actually done of this strategic plan. And that's it. While you've touched on a little bit, I want to go into a little bit more detail of why is it important? Why is it important to always be going back to that document on a regular basis when you're making decisions at the table? Why is it important? Well, it's important because typically a good strategic plan and, and, and two people sitting down over coffee at a table can't do a good strategic plan. So if they think they can, I would challenge that. But- um, I'll connect you with some mayors then. <laughs> but but I, I, I've, I've seen municipalities that either don't have a strategic plan or the one they have is maybe several years old. And obviously it's not doing what it should be doing, but a good strategic plan will have probably five or six key priorities. And then arising from each of those, there might be a total from those five or six, there might be a total of maybe a dozen um, action items. And it's important because those are the, the opportunity to sit down and work with your colleagues. And with your colleagues, I'm not talking about just elected official colleagues, but also senior administration as well, because they need to be in the room. They need to be involved because they're the ones who are having to, whose responsibility is, is to carry out the plan and to come forward with the action items that are going to make sure that you satisfy what the strategic, strategic plan is calling for. So admin needs to be in the room as well. But, uh, uh, not, but all, you, not all my administration needs to no, be no, there, just, right? Just, I'd, say, uh, I'd say the CAO and the general managers. And, and maybe if you wanna bring in your communications person and your HR person, whoever you consider to be at that top level just below the, uh, the the CAO, city manager, county manager, whatever you call the person, but they need to be in the room because you need to get their buy-in and how better to, to get their buy-in to have, to give them an opportunity to have input into the plan as well. And part, part of the reason why they're in the room is they can tell you whether you're asking for too much. I, we had a city manager here in Spruce Grove one time, when we went in for strategic planning, we walk into the room and there's a fish tank. And the fish tank is, has got some rocks in it and it's got, it's full right to the rim of water. And he had some rocks on the table and he says, if you ask us to do more, I'm having to place a rock, another rock or three or four more rocks into the tank. And there's no, there's no capacity either in that tank and we don't have the capacity to do anything more. So you're gonna have to make some, some decisions as to whether you're gonna give us more resources throw more money at a problem, give us more staff, whatever. So I think that was a really good exercise in um, having councilor, council members consider that, okay, their plate is full, they can't do anymore. So what can we do to help them? What makes a good council CAO relation? Because I think there's a lot of councils who get elected and they, like I said, they think they are running the show. They're running what the departments do. But in reality, councils have one employee and that's it. 
the mayor and counselors only have one employee and that's the CAO and the CAO hires everyone else. So at the end of the day, council can direct the CAO to do something, but they cannot direct directors to do something or managers to do something. How important is it to have a trust of your CAO that what council and counselors are directing is getting done by that CAO? Well, there has to be, you mentioned trust and trust is really important, but I would have to say that the other requirement is um, mutual respect. And we have to be able to trust and respect our CAO to do the best job that he or she can. And we have an opportunity on a regular ongoing basis to give instructions to our CAO, but we can't do that individually. Like I could never walk into our city manager's office and say, you know what, the snow clearing in this area of the city is, is lousy. Can you please get the graders out? I could never do that and nor could the mayor do that. So any direction has to come from council as a whole in council chambers. And, and that's, and obviously if I didn't know you, I could tell just from what you're saying that you do understand how municipal operations work. And I know that because you, partly because you've worked in a municipal government uh, capacity. So you, you have an under, understanding of this. Plus these, uh, these sessions that you do with uh, elected officials helps you a great deal as well. But the relationship between council and the CAO is incredibly important because we, a council members, councils establish policy bylaws and make those kinds of um, high level decisions. And then, then they turn those decisions over to um, the staff headed by the CAO, of course, to make those decisions happen in the community. And there's a once a year opportunity to evaluate the performance of the CAO. And maybe there might be other conversations depending on how you do things throughout the year to, uh, to maybe have some, some conversations about what's happening between uh, performance evaluations, but the performance evaluations are supposed to happen once a year, presumably near a year end. And that's our opportunity to say, yeah, things are working great or things are working are pretty good. And these are areas in which we, things can be, can be hap- we think things can be happening better, those kinds of things, or things are not going so well. So that's, that's our opportunity to have that kind of input into how our administrations are enacting the decisions that council, councils make. I have dealt with municipalities and I've dealt with uh, some cities over the my time in municipal government and as a journalist where councillors believe they can go in and talk to and direct staff to do certain things, whether it be clear this park, because I heard from so and so in my area that the park needs cleaning. So you need to go do it um, in your time as a consultant. Do you ha- do you ever come across that experience where you have to tell councillors? Your role is to set priorities, set bylaws, set the day-to-day uh, strategic plan of the uh, council, and your CAO is supposed to be directing staff to do what they need to do. It is not your job. It is the CAO's job. Chris, it happens. I've seen it as a consultant to local government, and I saw it happen uh, fairly frequently or fairly commonly when I was an elected official as well, where people would think, yeah, I can just march into the city manager's or the CAO's office and tell him or her how things should be done. But uh, I've been involved in my 26 years, I think I've been involved in about five different, I'm thinking back about five different occasions where we've recruited, interviewed and hired a new city manager. And one of the questions that I always like to ask, and I think this is a reasonable question, a good question that uh, council members should ask when they're interviewing candidates is, what would you do if the mayor or another member of council came into your office with a demand, and maybe demand is too strong a word, but with a suggestion as to how things would happen. And when people are, are, are candidates and they want the job and they're in an interview, they're always gonna say what they think that they, uh, they, they know that you want to hear, but you have to be able to ascertain whether they're being sincere because the right answer is, well, I would t- talk to the council member. I would say, okay, we'll take that under advisement but give the council member no assurance that things will be done on the suggestion that the council member is asking. And sometimes where it's actually being something that's re- that would require too much in the way of resources, maybe staff time or extra spending would, would be required. Then I've, I've had CEOs say, I'm gonna take this, not to me, but I, I, I've heard because they've told us this, um, uh, I'll take this to council because it requires too much resources and that kind of a decision has to be a council decision. 
We are, as I said, we're, we're in it on present time. We're coming out of the end of COVID-19. We are hopefully at the end of it. I'm crossing my fingers on that. Um, in your opinion, as you are consulting with municipalities across Alberta and Canada and different provinces, what are you seeing as the biggest obstacles uh, municipalities are facing right now? I would say, bar none, the biggest challenge is and will continue to be for the foreseeable future, financial. Uh, maintaining, I would say that maintaining and growing services while te- keeping tax increases in line will be something that will really test municipalities. Uh, municipalities were seriously hampered during COVID restrictions. And while I'd say now that municipalities have pretty much resumed full operations, there will be some financial costs that have to be dealt with. I'll stress that operational and cost efficiencies um, will be our biggest challenges today and going forward. I think that councils would be wise to ask questions about operational efficiency to ensure that your organization is running as efficiently as possible. Uh, I remember years ago, our CAO here created a program to cut a million dollars a year in operational costs and engage the cooperation and involvement of staff to make it happen. And they did make it happen. So I think maybe that's something, an idea that local elected officials could try is, are, is there, ask if there's some, and, and some to, often staff will tell you, now there's no fat on this bone, but there usually is something that they're spending money on that they don't need to, but maybe try that. And I think that some municipalities will be considering large tax increases in the next three or four years. No one wants that. So as a rate pair, you might want to buckle down, Chris, because I'm not saying what's going to happen in, in the city in which you live, but I think there's going to be, a, a, there, there might be, a, councils might be inclined to impose some higher than normal tax increases and, break, and blame it on COVID perhaps. And that's not something that anybody wants to see. When I was a certified financial planner and an investment advisor, I, I, did, I spent a lot of time uh, learning about these things. And I remember that there are studies that say that roughly half of Canadian households would be in severe financial jeopardy if the primary wage earner lost two paychecks. And if you think about that, and I'm not saying they'd go bankrupt, but it would cause them perhaps at the very least to dip into, into debt uh, in order to uh, solve a financial crisis. People are hurting out there, and I think elected officials need to respect that. I want to get your opinion on something because you've been there. You were talking to this, these municipalities, and I, I, it's more of a question that I've been thinking to myself over the last few years since I've left municipal politics and in my time in journalism. Um, Councillors and mayors have a hard time passing a budget that has a tax increase. Um, It's always hard to pass the buck on to your citizens. You try to cut the fat. You look at cutting the fat. You do the process that you say, well, where you talk to city employees and say, where do you think we can find savings? And they will come back. But it's always hard to do. Um, Political will of doing something that is not always the best is hard, right? Because you want to always get reelected, especially if you're running for reelection. When does it come apparent to councillors and municipalities that sometimes you have to raise service fees, you have to raise taxes, because if you don't, you'll have to cut services, you'll have to cut uh, certain uh, things that our citizens have come to rely on. Is there a political will to do that? Or are we stuck in a a cycle where we try to keep taxes as low as possible, even if it's to the detriment of services that citizens have come to rely on? I don't think it's difficult uh, for councils to impose modest tax increases. Like by that, I would say maybe something like two two or three, pardon me? One or 2% or something like that? I would say two, two and a half, three percent even. I I think those are modest. And and most people will understand that costs go up. However, people will sometimes also say that, you know what, my, my salary hasn't gone up, my household income hasn't gone up, and my inflation rate hasn't, well, lately it's different because of increases in, in food and, and gasoline, but, uh, for example, but um, my, my household uh, inflation rate hasn't gone up, but people need to understand that the inflation rate for homes 
uh, and the inflation rate for municipalities, they're very different because municipalities buy an entirely different basket of goods and services that, that inflate by a, a significantly, a higher rate anyway, on most occasions. Um, but the other point you make about it's difficult to, and I think you're entirely correct on this, to cut services because a couple of years ago, we decided that we weren't going to trim grass along medians and along roadways and those kinds of things, except maybe once or twice a year rather than doing it like every three weeks or every month. And people noticed and they complained. And people don't want, people say, well, don't raise my taxes. But when you say, well, what services are you willing to give up? And are you willing to have less grass cutting uh, to avoid a tax increase? Uh, they, they might say yes, but when, when the grass is growing uh, high in, in medians along the highway, for example, they, they, they complain about that. Um, my last question to you is this, Wayne, because we're, we're almost at the hour mark and I want to get this in just in case people want to learn more about your organization, but also want to reach out to you if they're a counselor and say, maybe you can answer this question for me. How can people contact your organization and how can people contact you if they have questions or if they want to bring you into the municipality? Well, uh, I, have a, I have a new email address, Bloom email address. I'll try to get it correct, but I'll give both just in case. But my Bloom email address is wayne.roth at bloomcme.ca or .com. It's, it's new and I've hardly used it, but uh, W-A-Y-N-E dot and Roth has an E on the end, so R-O-T-H-E. And my personal, my business email address is uh, wroth at wayneroth.com. So W-R-O-T-H-E. Uh, at, at wayneroth.com. If you send an email to wayneroth.com without the E, it goes to some dude in Texas. Which <laughs> for those who are listening and watching, I just want to jump in here. If you don't want to roll back and just try to rewrite that, scroll down in the show notes. The links to both of his emails will be there. So that way you will be able to just click and then you'll pop up a new email and it'll be sent off to you. Um, if I may... I'll just yep. restate that the company is Bloom Center for Municipal Education, so you can find the website there too. Bloom Center for Community Education. For, for mu municipal education. Oh, municipal education. I do apologize. And we will link the, the information to Bloom Center down in the links as well. Um, Wayne, um, this has been an honor. I feel like we've barely scratched the surface of municipal politics and how municipal politicians and uh, councils are coping and what makes a good counselor but i want to thank you i want to thank you for sitting down and doing this like i said we will probably possibly we will have you back on because i feel like we like i said we just scratched the surface and i want to continue this conversation because i think and you think as well municipal politics is the frontline politics of our society and we need to take more attention to it because it usually is the forgotten one and, and you know what the risk the danger is when you have two guys like us who are very, very interested in local government. Uh, this, this could go on all afternoon if we wanted to, but I, I'm here if you want to uh, do, do another session or, or whatever. We might have to bring you back on monthly because like you said, we might be doing this on a regular basis because I found this a fascinating last hour and I can imagine that my viewers and my listeners will as well. Um, Wayne, thank you so much for doing this. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for involving me. So with that, I want to remind everyone the links to Wayne is in the show notes. So please scroll down. If you want to send an email, check him out, more information, click on the show notes. I highly recommend. But also, as I say in all my interviews, and this is no exception, get out from behind social media for at least 10 minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It makes our society better. It makes our democracy better. And it makes us as a people better. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. And this has been the Cross Border Interviews with with Chris Brown. Keep talking, everyone.